Welcome to the Creative Community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and my guest this time is photographer Patricia Houghton-Clark. Patricia, welcome. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. It's great to have you back after we were thinking, what, nine years or something? Probably something like that, yeah. It's been a while. Crazy. Um, so uh, that's one of the, the great things I've been enjoying about this reboot of Creative Community 2.0 is to, to reconnect with people uh -huh. who I, I spoke with you know, a number of years ago. Uh -huh. And I, if I remember correctly, that's about the time that you were just getting ready to start off on a project that we're going to spend most of our time talking about. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, before we get to facing ourselves, though, um, for people who don't know you, just tell us a little bit about your, your background as a, as a photographer. And in particular, I'd love to hear about a, a specific camera that you are enamored oh, of. David is enamored of my camera. <laughs> it's called a Holga. And it is a plastic camera. Right. It was made as a toy camera, and it uh, shoots with medium format film. Okay. And the, one of the things I love about the camera is that it's a manual wind, and so when you're shooting, you can actually create these long leg negatives that look like storylines. They do, yeah. And so there's no you know, real post-production to them, and um, there's no Photoshop. And, You're and just printing what's on the It's cool, layer. because then you go in and you edit from the film, uh -huh. and it, you're familiar with that work. Yeah. And I, I, I love shooting with that. It's, it's really uh, got a completely different quality to it yeah. than shooting digitally, for sure. Well, you, as we were talking before the camera started rolling, took a picture of me and uh, my late St. Bernard. That mm -hmm. is one of my favorite images mm -hmm. in the whole wide world. Uh -huh. But you started off, you weren't, you didn't start off as a photographer. You, you did some things earlier. You loved to travel. Um, mm -hmm. what, what's, your, what's your sort of background from childhood? So to? from childhood, I was raised in a family of eight girls. And I don't know if you know that. It's I, kind of one of the funny, odd facts about me. I don't me. think I did know that. Yes. And... Uh, I was raised in a family where there was always room for one more. Uh -huh. And I've kind of been flashing on how that's affected my work right. quite a bit. And so I have seven sisters, beautiful women. Um, and we were raised in a kind of an unusual way where there was a lot of creativity in certain areas. And then it was really kind of not that way. Mm -hmm. We went to Catholic schools mm -hmm. and wore uniforms and, and the whole thing. But... Um, I left home at 18, and I began traveling shortly thereafter. I uh, got married young, mm -hmm. and uh, was really traveling around the world for about two and a half years, which included a four-month stint driving across Africa from London to Nairobi. Wow. And that was a really, really formative experience. And I also studied uh, batik in Java mm -hmm. for three months and worked in a little bamboo hut with yeah. some artists there. So I've had... Um, some no really camera at this time, though, right? I had an Instamatic. Uh -huh. <laughs> so did I. I had a little do you Instamatic. Still have those, do you still have those I pictures? Don't, I, I do have the pictures. In fact, there's a story I'll tell you um, that's in Facing Ourselves that relates to that. Uh, but so came back from Europe, started a nonprofit with my husband, right, right. affordable housing nonprofit called Homes for People, had a couple of kids, taught art through City College Adult Ed. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we took our children traveling for two and a half years. Wow. And they became trilingual by the end of that time. And um, yeah, I've written and I've done a lot of art, but I was always photographing mm -hmm. along the way. And it, I sort of describe it as sort of waking up and realizing that your best friend is actually your lover. Mm -hmm. So the camera was always with me, but I didn't focus on that as my medium until much later. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I continued to do a lot of nonprofit work, and I tutored Hmong Lao women here mm -hmm. in Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. tutored English. And, and you've also photographed. Yes, well, I went yeah. back there to, to see where they came yeah, from. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, worked at the Bowl. I was the executive director at the Bowl. You were, that's right. Yeah. 
and uh, put on some really fun events, including Babes at the Bowl. Uh -huh. And uh, so when I left the bowl, I decided to go into photography full time. And that really changed my life, mm -hmm. that period of time where I made that transition into photography. Uh, I didn't realize until I started showing my work that my father and my grandfather, who were also Houghtons, mm -hmm. were photographers. Okay. I never knew that until I started showing the work, and my dad said, well, you know, I used to teach photography. Oh, wow. And I said, oh, you what? never mentioned that when you, you were growing up? never mentioned it? <laughs> no. And um, so that's a kind of an interesting little twist. Yeah. And uh, so I've been working freelance on my own projects. I do a little bit of commercial work when people need some portraits mm -hmm. or something. But really, I, I take my work into a lot of areas of social justice work, as right. it turns out. Right, yeah. That trip to Laos was uh, to go back and see where the people came from mm -hmm. that I had worked with and learned a lot about the world and how it was changing at that time in 2006. And I started a project called Erasing Lines at that time. And it was just this amazing time of shifting. You could feel it, you know. There was like sort of this inexorable shift of people migrating mm -hmm. and people changing um, the way they communicate with phones. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting. So it was a time that I really understood that when you are a photographer, it's best to show up open mm -hmm. to what's there mm -hmm. rather than what, for me, th right. than what I imagined that I was going to bring home. But you clearly somehow realized that this was something that was not going to change. I mean, that's one of the reasons it's so important for us to look at these photographs today mm -hmm. is because we are all going to be migrants or living with migrants, mm -hmm. whether we like it or not. That's right. That's <laughs> um, right. Well, let's, let's go to um, the show Facing Ourselves, which has appeared everywhere. Unfortunately, probably by the time folks out there in TV land are watching this, it may have already left Carpinteria, but it um, is a show that you're, you're really happy with, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. I am really happy with it. Um, let's take a look at the, the first image okay. that, that we have uh, to, to see, and um, I'll just sort of let you talk us through what we're looking at. Okay. This image uh, was shot in a, in a little town in uh, southern Italy called Martignano, and I had done an artist residency there in 2011. And I spent a month in this little village in uh, the heel of the boot in mm -hmm. Puglia mm -hmm. and um, did this series of work there during Lent and Easter and it, that hadn't really been photographed before. And so at the end of my month there, we did a slideshow in the piazza. And so I really felt like I was embedded in this tiny town. And five years went by after I left there and the, the refugee crisis started happening in all over, but right. particularly the Mediterranean, right. and particularly in Italy. Mm -hmm. And they were sort of renowned for their attitude towards bringing, welcoming refugees. So welcoming, yeah. So I flew back there in order to just talk to them about it, because I was so fascinated by their own migratory history. They speak ancient Greek in this village, mm -hmm. this Italian village, which tells you a lot. Right. And they also have migrated out for economic reasons forever. You know, and so they were very uh, open to talking about this. And, and I, I, I came away with this one comment that I've repeated many times, which is the first time I went, 2016, to talk about this particular topic. I was asking one of my subjects, how is it that you can be so welcoming when you have so little? And he just looked at me, just sort of matter of fact, and he said, well, we know what it's like to carry a suitcase. Mm. It's so simple and it's so profound at the same time. Right, and so maybe people who don't remember what it's like to carry a suitcase are those who are least open, unfortunately. That may be true. Yeah. That may be true. Yeah. Let's take a look at a, a, okay. another image. Um, we've got so many great ones to, to, to cover. This is actually the first family that I photographed for the series, and that is the guy that made that statement to me. Okay. And uh, so it was really with them that I developed this style for doing the portraits, mm -hmm. um, all natural light and finding a window and a chair. And this is with the whole guy? 
This is digital. This is digital, okay. This is with digital, okay. uh, yeah. It still so, uh, captures a lot of the, the shadows that I remember from, mm -hmm. from that. That's right, from that's that right. Camera. Well, it's a chiaroscuro, mm -hmm. and I, it's always been a style that I really, really loved that I became fascinated with, with Rembrandt's work when sure. I was a little girl. Caravaggio, sure. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at the next one. This uh, man, his name is Donato, and I always refer to him as my Italian boyfriend. Oh, really? I just adore him. <laughs> He's the sweetest person, and he and his family really have taken me in. I spend a lot of time with them when I'm there, and he, you can see, is just a, this wise person, and he was a migrant worker at the age of 15. Okay. And he went to France. And he literally, one day when I was with him, he said, here's what we used to do. And he got up, and he's quite elderly, and he got into this groove of how they used the scythe mm. in France when he was a teenager. So it's this memory that never left his yeah. body, which yeah. is really, really interesting. And it clearly never left his soul and heart never, either. Yeah. Never, yeah. yeah. Let's keep looking at, at, at more oh, images. Okay. And we're, the people are just joining us. We're looking at uh, uh, photographs from Facing Ourselves um, with Patricia Houghton Clark, the photographer. This is a young couple uh, by the name of Luca and Clara. And uh, they are fairly recent um, migrants from the north of Italy, but their families originated in the south. Okay. So their families went from south to north. And then as a young couple, they, they decided the to repopulate right. in the South. And as a result, they have now kind of been filtering in with other artist friends that have come in. Mm -hmm. And so they're starting a new generation of life hmm. in these villages. Right. It's really interesting. Yeah. These two young men were introduced to me um, in 2017 when I went back to do more uh, work with the project, and I was introduced to a, a refugee um, center called Filos Multiculturale. It's very difficult for me to say. But they work with migrants uh, from all over, and they uh, have government support, and they, they find, help find jobs, and they, they do all these great things with these, with these refugees. Some of them are asylum seekers, and these two young men, uh, the, the man on the left is from Pakistan, and he was a jockey hmm. in Pakistan. And the man from the right is from Western Africa. And they decided, this little village called Zolino, decided that the way that they could help these young men would be to give them a job. And the job they gave them was to take care of the town donkey. <laughs> And so the, it was so they, amazing. They're doing it too, it aren't they? It was so amazing because they, you can see they just love this donkey and their job, and they were learning Italian together, and they lived together. Right. And you think, so with nothing, this town created something right. for them to be proud. Right. It, it was just so that's phenomenal. That's kind of really moving, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So was the donkey just sort of in the center of town? or what? Well, the donkey had a job, and it was <laughs> to eat weeds. Okay. So that was sort of their, their <laughs> you know, sanitation department or something. <laughs> but, you know, the, one, the last comment that the Pakistani guy said to me was, the donkey doesn't know the difference. Right. right. He can't tell that we don't speak the same language. Right. Right. As long as they're kind to him and give him mm -hmm. his oats. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Let's keep on looking. We're, we're looking okay. at photographs from, from facing ourselves. And um, who's this? His name is Doso, and he is from Ivory Coast. And he, uh, a lot of these people that you see, um, particularly who came from Africa, spent a very, very, very long time, often walking for years to get to Libya to get on one of those boats mm -hmm. to try and make it across. Mm -hmm. And he's a soccer player, and he uh, agreed to sit for me and um, left his family behind and hoping for a better life. Tell me a little bit about that process. So uh, did, you, did you seek him out uh, as a... How, how did he come into your... I've been, I've been so fortunate, and it actually is a, an essential piece to what I'm doing, mm -hmm. which is that 
it takes a village for me to do this work. Okay, so somebody says, hey. So in Martignano, there's a man by the name of Leo Rielli, and he runs the local cultural center. And he really, really is in sync with this concept of creating community and welcoming people. Mm -hmm. And so he really has partnered with me. And he would say, okay, I'm going to take you to go meet this older couple. Right. We'll go have coffee with them and introduce you and, and then kind of help set up the portrait sessions. And so I show up and I, I really want to be an objective mm -hmm. observer. And I don't show up with a list of sort of what kinds of people or what ages or mm -hmm. anything. And, and it's a very organic process. That's happened for me there, and it happened for me in London, and it's also happened in Carpinteria. Well, the, as the, the images that we've seen so far, I mean, other than their great beauty, one of the things they have in common is a real dignity to the subject, I mm -hmm. would say. So um, are you saying pose like this, or are you just sort of letting them, you're just, just taking a lot them. of pictures? Take a lot of, I spend a lot of time talking to them first. Uh, Almost without exception, I make everyone leave the room if there's anyone else okay. involved. Okay. And we spend it, I mean, it's like this. Right. Where I'm just really close to them and we're having a conversation. And fortunately, I speak Italian. And so that facilitated some of those conversations, mm -hmm. particularly in Italy. But um, it really is about explaining to them that I'm not looking at their surface. And I'm interested in who they are mm -hmm. and how they want to show themselves. Okay. So I understand for myself, my job isn't to go to a refugee camp or go to the border, which is super important. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of photographers who are, thank goodness, doing, doing that. Doing great work there, yeah. So I'm kind of going into a different sort mm -hmm. of venue with them and saying, how do you want to look? Mm -hmm. What do you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. and, and also that when we're, we're having a conversation, when I put my camera up, we're still having a conversation, mm -hmm. even if there are no words. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm very specific about that, that at a certain point we stop talking mm -hmm. because it helps people kind of s settle in. And then I just start shooting and they, you know, occasionally I'd say, well, do you mind turning this way or that because I'm dependent on the sure, light coming yeah, in. Right. And um, it's fascinating actually. It's very rare for someone to be very uncomfortable after that. Mm -hmm. And if they are at a certain point, they'll start kind of letting down a little bit and then they'll show, you know, and it's, through you know eye. how it is. It's yeah. always through the eyes that it it'll is. show yeah. up. Yeah. So it's a really interesting process. But yes, they, they're they different that way. Yeah, well, that's a mm -hmm. fascinating explanation. Let's keep on looking at, at photographs okay. from facing ourselves. His, uh, this is a, it's a long story, I'm only going to tell you a piece of it, okay. but he uh, is from Nigeria, and from eastern Nigeria, and he, uh, I met him in Zolino, and in a church, which is really the only place that he feels safe. Mm. And he came from Nigeria after uh, his family was murdered. In fact, his family was murdered in a marketplace that I had photographed in 1974. Wow. So it was a really interesting full circle mm -hmm. about this connection I had with him. And during our, our film interview, he said to the interviewer, and I was running away because I'm Christian and I was being chased and I was shot in the back. Mm -hmm. And oh, he said, you. do you want to see? Yeah. And then he pulled his shirt up, right. and I fortunately was just sitting there with my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in the house because this quiet, lovely, yeah, very gosh. reverential person who just said, would you like me to show you? Right, and that's just a brutal image, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Even if we don't know the, the backstory, exactly. there's clearly something of great trauma going mm -hmm. on. Well, I, since you brought up cell phones, I just want to, I was, we were talking before and I was asking you why, even though I have a cell phone, <laughs> I can't take the pictures that you take. I mean, I know it's obviously a lot of um, practice and stuff like that, but is, is there something that you're talking about, just that communication with your, your subject? There, there's some way that you get in to see people that someone like me can't do, right? Is, is it magic? Experience? Maybe, maybe. I, magic. Don't know. I don't know. Um, 
I've been I've been traveling for a really long time, mm -hmm. and so I'm I'm I've always been an observer. Right. I, as a little girl, I was always an observer. I had a microscope, and I was always out walking and looking at things. So, I that's part of my nature. Uh -huh. And over time, I've gotten more and more and more focused on humanity mm -hmm. and, and really close up humanity. Right. And um, I just pay attention, I guess. Yeah. I, it's important to me. Yeah, well, and I think that's a quality of any artist, isn't it, really? Yeah, so. it's just important to me. I, I notice little nuances. And I was with somebody, it was funny, I was with somebody the other day at the opening of the show, and she was asking me about this. Right. And we were talking, and all of a sudden she said, Why are you looking she at goes, me? She goes, you're reading me, aren't you? And I said, yeah. I know, I was like, <laughs> she I suddenly should, got very should have ironed this ball. shirt before I went on camera with Patricia. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you ever think about working in, in other media? I mean, is that something that you think, well, I've, I've done, I'm a master photographer, I want to learn how to draw, or is that ever? Well, I did a lot of drawing, and I did a lot of painting, right. and I've written a lot. I used to play music. So you've already, yeah. I have, and for me, photography amazingly became the vehicle where it all came together. Okay. So I don't imagine myself actually... This is, this is what works best for you. It's, it's, well, you remember my first show. We talked mm -hmm. about the first show. Mm -hmm. And literally, when we put the images on the wall for my first show, I stood back and I felt like they had taken duct tape off my mouth. Uh, so I, it was such a moment for me to think, oh... I can speak. I can talk now. Yeah. This yeah. is me. This yeah. is me speaking. Yeah. So I'm really, really fortunate and so happy that I... Made that connection, right? You yeah. know. Well, let's keep going back okay. to um, to the images from uh, from facing ourselves. This is a her name is Zikra, yeah. and she is this beautiful little girl. Um, I got to know her family in London through an organization called Waging Peace, mm -hmm. and they invited me to uh, come and work with their staff and their volunteers and their asylum seekers uh, and, the, and the immigrants that they work with from the Sudan. Uh, the group was founded by uh, a couple who actually live here part-time, Rebecca and Henry Tinsley okay. in London. And Zikra's mother uh, escaped the Sudan with her two sons and settled into London and they invited me to come to their home. And Zikra, we picked her up at school, and she was in her adorable little, you know, English schoolgirl mm -hmm. outfit. And when we got home, she raced upstairs and put on this dress, oh, okay. which is just so yeah, sweet, so this cute, little yeah. sort of ballerina dress yeah. almost, you know. She was so proud. And, yeah. and, and what's so striking about this photograph is how much it's not <laughs> her, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's uh, the curtain uh, mm -hmm. and the, the wall. And, mm -hmm. That's really, really mm -hmm. something. Thank you. Her name is Rehab, and she is also, uh, I photographed her in London, and she is also a Sudanese uh, refugee, and she's been in London for quite a while now, and she's very uh, involved in the uh, female genital mutilation issue mm -hmm. that... I believe most of the women in Sudan have had to deal with. Okay. And so in London, she's really involved in the anti-FGM. And you can see that she's got a very strong... Oh my gosh, yeah. Very strong person. This is the poster. It's a banner, actually, a vinyl banner that's hanging outside of the Carpinteria Arts Center right now as part of the Facing Ourselves project. And it has images on it that are from not only Carpinteria, but from around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the bottom of the banner, you can see uh, all the countries named that I could, that I could come up with right. that are represented in these people. So that's it's a kind lot. of, it's <laughs> a lot. Mm -hmm. This is Letty. She lives in, actually she lives in Ventura and she is a, a painter. And she has a gallery in Carpinteria. And she's this beautiful woman that I've known over the years. And she agreed to be one of my subjects 
in Carpinteria, we were photographing at the public library. The Santa Barbara Public Library System became one of my sponsors. Oh. Several foundations and you know individuals and organizations have sponsored the you project. Want to shout out to the others, real quick. The Santa Barbara Foundation, the McCune Foundation, the Natalie Orfila Foundation, the Carp Growers, the Carpinteria Art Center, the Library, um, Silo One Eighteen. You know, waging peas, Parco Parmier. I mean, <laughs> it it's kind of yeah, it, it's amazing, yeah. and and also I, I just want to mention that um, in Carpinteria in particular, I've had more time for developing the project, and there have been all these adjunct projects mm -hmm. popping up. Mm -hmm. For example, a friend of mine said, "Well, I'd love to help you raise some money, because this is a self-funded project." Right. And so she said, "Well, I'm an I'm an artist and I'm a fabric artist." So she created a series of workshops, uh, okay. where the these women gathered and created story cloths, which is a tradition that comes from South America, particularly particularly from Chile, during Pinochet's mm. rule of terror. And women were making these cloths to talk about their disappearing fam family members. Mm -hmm. So there's all these different kind of classes and poetry mm -hmm. workshops and things where people want to offer because they, they feel powerless yeah. and they want to have something to offer to help talk Absolutely. about this. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We just have like that's about a minute and a half mm -hmm. left, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we can finish up with one final image uh, from the show. Let's see whatever... Whatever pops up. Okay, we can we can end with Deirdre. This is Deirdre, and she is actually one of my neighbors in Carpinteria. And uh, she, at this moment, is in Terezin, in Poland, mm. visiting where her family passed away. Oh. And she was also one of the people who supported the project and taught classes. And she's uh, she's got a very strong, obviously, immigrant background and humanitarian background with her her Jewish family history and so this and it's kind of the why it's yeah, the why the it's of, the why um, question surprise and mm -hmm. um, yeah uncertainty but also great intelligence too absolutely yeah. well as we um, see the final, <laughs> final <laughs> image here um, and we come back to the studio um, I just want to say it, well, it's great to have you here. I'm glad Thank that you. you know you went to the high school in Santa Barbara. And I'm, I'm glad you mm -hmm. came. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so folks, if um, you have a chance to see Facing Ourselves wherever it might happen mm -hmm. to be, you should do it. And we do have a website, okay. facingourselves.org. Okay. And it is uh, hopefully traveling, going to keep traveling, and we're fundraising, and we're getting more and more support from all over the world. So. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Patricia. Thank you. The Creative Community is produced in cooperation with CAPS Media in Ventura, here in Santa Barbara, TVSB, JP Montalvo and his fantastic crew, also with a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Roth Foundation. I'm David Starkey, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.